What's going on, folks? Um, yeah, a little bit of a different backdrop here. Uh, I was supposed to make this video a day or two ago. I promised a, a former client. I won't say former client. I don't believe any of my clients are former clients. They're just clients that was having some trouble with their dogs. And I told her I was going to talk about this because it's so important because it's something that so many people go through. And it's something that anyone who truly follows me knows that this is something I've preached forever and has been the most important part of my program or the most important, the meat and potatoes of what I believe, okay? Whether you agree or not, um, I think it'll be hard to disagree, but I just wanted to touch it on a little bit here, all right? And it's not just for this one particular client, it's for so many people. And like I said, if you go back through my stuff, I think we've been putting out videos for probably 10 years, 11 years. It's something that I believe in so much and it's something that so many fail in. So let's get right to it. I'll give you a little bit of backdrop with this client. Someone that I think extremely highly of, you know, absolutely phenomenal person who's done a tremendous job with her dogs. So uh, I don't know, probably about two years ago I started working with her, I guess. Two enormous dogs. I mean, giant, giant dogs. As big as a dog gets, pretty much. Big, giant, powerful dogs. Um, this individual lives in a very busy area, apartment complex, a lot of people, a lot of dogs. The dogs are pretty out of control outside on leash. Um, she has had major neck in injuries, major back industries. These, dog have, these dogs have yanked her around, slammed her into walls, slammed her into poles, like real serious stuff, you know? And uh, she was just fed up and, and wanted help. So I started helping her and she did tremendous. You know, she did absolutely tremendous outside of the home. I'll tell you why I'm saying that. You know, she'd send me videos of her dogs off leash outside with other dogs running around that they'd normally have an issue with and go after, like really good stuff. I was very proud of her, you know? But even though I address it with everyone, not everyone always pays attention to what I think is most important. And part of the reason is when people find quick success with the behavioral problems that they call you for, sometimes they drop their guard and get a little lax on where it really counts, all right? So the one thing that I did address up front in the beginning, what I saw is I didn't like how the living arrangements were inside the home. Anyone who knows me knows that I believe the behavior is number one. How you live with your dog dictates how they live with you, okay? I, I talk about the 80-20 rule. I believe 80% of it is the behavior, how your dog behaves around you, inside your home. Maybe 20%, and I think that's being really generous, is the obedience. Because I think obedience, for the most part, is really simple. I think a monkey could teach most dogs obedience. So when I say obedience, I mean your basic commands. You know, all the sit, down, come, place, all that stuff. It's just not that important to me, okay? The behavior is. And again, for those who don't know my background, when I started in dogs, um, I didn't really do any, I did very little obedience, if any. My dogs were trained on a leash with the flat buckle collar. They didn't do anything fancy. They didn't do anything cool or impressive. The reason I started getting um, approach from people or recognized was because of the way my dogs behaved off leash in public in busy areas. That was it. That's what I cared about. And to this day, that's still the most important part. I do a lot of the other things, but honestly, if I had to stop doing it tomorrow, I, I, I wouldn't care. I just always wanted really well-behaved dogs. And that's what most people want, okay? So on the obedience outside of the home, she did tremendous things beautifully. Now she could walk both her dogs without getting slammed around and worrying about injury. And, and that enhances the dog's life also because they get out and they get to do more. And they were allowed to be off leash. But back to that, I didn't like what I saw inside. Inside, I saw way too much freedom and pampering of the dogs. Just way too much. And that, for me, is a no-no, okay? If you're going to do one thing, you know, when someone becomes my client, what I give them to do on the obedience side is very simple. 
and when I ask them for as much as I ask them or as how, how little I ask them, and you'll be, they're always surprised. I'll tell them, give me five minutes, 10 if you have the time, twice a day on the obedience. And they're amazed by, that's all you want? Yes, but here's the catch. On the behavior side, I need 24 hours a day. That means 24 hours a day, especially when you're with your dog, you're teaching that dog how to be part of your lives, okay? And where we screw up in this country in particular, from what I've seen in other countries, is we put way too much emotion on our dogs, confusing emotion to the dogs, way too much affection, um, not enough guidance inside the home, okay? Not enough. And so I know there's so many trainers out there, you know, that talk about they don't care if the dog, you know, sleeps on the couch, lays on the bed, doesn't care, you know, if they're at the table and you're eating. I, I get that. But what you have to understand, guys, is with all the people I work with that have behavioral problems for their dogs, all their dogs have the same habits inside the home. And that's pretty much no guidance and, and no boundaries or rules whatsoever. They do what they want when they want. And eventually that's going to blow up. And so even though, you know, I'll see cute Facebook posts from my clients, you know, doing things with their dogs inside the home and they know I'm watching, I'll just comment. I'll make a little emoji face or something, let them know, I, I see what you're doing. And it's not something I approve of. And they feel that it's harmless, but often it's not. It's just not. So in this case, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Um, two mild-mannered dogs, giant breeds, okay, but mild-mannered. Recently, the woman's adult daughter came home. I think she was away or doesn't live in the house. Came home. I don't know the exact story. And I think she went to move the dog off the couch or, or something. I'm sorry. I don't remember exactly. It was kind of out of it when, when we spoke a little bit through text. And the dog refused and growled at her. And I don't remember where it went from there, but that's all I needed to hear. We were just talking through text. And that's not surprising to me. I knew that was coming. Okay. So what do you do from there? If you have this dog that's like, I don't know, 180 pounds, 190 pounds, it's enormous, that decides it gives you both middle fingers and says, F you, this is my couch now. Get away from me. What do you do? Do you stand there and go through with removing that dog, which really does need to be done? Or do you back up because you're scared, rewarding the dog for its behavior? So then it becomes a very serious issue. And then I was told that a third dog, a puppy, was just introduced into the home. And I think, I, I should have looked at this stuff before, I think the comment was, they're doing pretty good around the puppy, but they'll growl when the puppy goes near their food. See, these are all recipes for disaster. And when I told them then, you'll get away with it now, but once that puppy reaches six months old, seven months old, eight months old, Eventually, it's going to be a disaster, and there's no way you're separating these dogs because of the size of them once things go bad, okay? Um, the behavior is everything to me, absolutely everything. So, you know, some of the people that will go after me and, and, and criticize the stuff I do, the work I do, I, I get it. It's very easy to do when you take small parts of the overall picture of the amount of content that I've put out there for over the years. But anyone who truly knows knows the behavior is the one thing that I preach constantly. I don't give a shit about the obedience if you're focusing on how to teach that dog to live with you properly. Plain and simple. But that's also why I bust my ass with my own dogs for those first two years. Those first two years, I develop a self-sufficient dog and when I mean self-sufficient, it doesn't mean it lets itself up to go out of, you know, by itself. And I just mean a dog that I can leave unattended wherever I'm at and they're not going to do stupid things. You know, I could leave to go to work and leave the dogs inside the home and they're not going to do stupid things. You know, you create the behavior you want good and bad inside the home. But again, that's just my opinion. But I've had really good dogs for a very long time. And the beautiful thing about it is, is when the owners change their bad habits immediately, 
the dogs start to change immediately. Now there will be certain cases where you get a really strong dog that will try to fight you on this stuff. Um, I made a post yesterday or the day before, a letter that I give my clients, okay? I do, now I do a minimum of a three week boarding train, okay? That three week boarding train is just the foundation. You don't train a dog in three weeks. That three week boarding train comes with a minimum of 10 private lessons, a minimum of 10 private lessons with the owner because the most important part is the education of the owner. But in reality, when I'm your dog trainer, I'm your dog trainer for life of that dog as long as you want me. I deal with a lot of people that are very well off financially. And so there's not a lot of industries that you can't just throw money at to get what you want. Dog training is one of those industries where the dog don't give a shit how much money you have or who you are or what you don't have. Doesn't care about the size of your yard, the size of your house, or if people like you or hate you, it doesn't matter. The truth is these dogs have to live with us in harmony for a long time, for pretty much 24 hours a day, because it's whether you're there or not, okay? So a lot is being taught inside that home. How much time do you actually spend on obedience outdoors? Not a lot. But again, like I said, a monkey could teach obedience. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just not that important. Having a dog that could do a lot of really cool things doesn't give you a well-behaved dog. Just go to any sport competition on the field. You know, um, any police department, you know, that has some strong dogs. It doesn't lead to a well-behaved dog. Highly trained dog in obedience is great. But to me, it's useless if you don't have the behavior to go along with it. It, it. it just doesn't, you know. I didn't start teaching, you know, a lot of you guys knew Bruno, my Rottweiler. I didn't start teaching him any kind of obedience until he was four years old. He was a great dog, you know. He got me a lot of attention. We never did anything. I didn't start using e-collars until 11 years ago, 2008. Up until then, it was all leash and flat buckle collar, which is still mostly what I do but yet everyone wants to think it's, it's about a tool. Um, I have an advantage because I'm so OCD about the behavior inside my home, but so is my wife, so are my children, okay? They go along with the plan, and that's why when I travel and go away for a long period of time, whether it's for you know my other job or the dog stuff, my kids take care of the dogs. Renzo just turned 10 last week. He could take care of the dogs. That's really important. I'll give you another example. Um, I talked about Bear before, my German Shepherd. We took Bear into my house when my dad died. My dad died in 2009. Bear was five years old. Pretty out of control in many ways. My dad loved that dog, but that dog had no rules. He dictated what went on from where he ate to the time he ate to who was around, who, who wasn't around. You know, my dad couldn't control him. Um, one day, I'm talking to my dad on the phone, and he says, you know, this friggin' dog, I can't take him anymore. He's useless. I can't even take him for a walk. I said, listen, I'm coming up in a couple of weeks. I'll fix that. He said, not a chance. It's okay. You know, this is probably, I don't know, 2007 or so. And so when I got there, I told my dad, you can come with us on the walk. I said, but you're not walking with us. You stay behind. I want you out of the picture. He said, okay. So I send my dad out first to go wait outside. And then I leave the house with the dog and, and we go for a walk. And the first obstacle, when I look back at my dad, there were two guys. My dad lived on a real busy street in New Jersey. Two guys working on a car. And my father looked at me like, watch now, asshole. You're going to see what he does. And we walked past the two guys and the dog did nothing. You know, my father was like, I don't understand it. And we continued to walk, no problems the whole time. Then towards the end of the walk, we see a woman with a young pit bull across the street. And I say, my, call my dad over. I say, go ask her if she minds if we go over there. My dad says, are you out of your effing mind? You're not taking that dog over there. You know, he's going to kill that dog. I said, just go ask her. Well, he did. And he weighs me over. We go over and we're talking to the lady. And, and Bear just hung out with me. He didn't care that the dog was there. He didn't care what the dog was there because that dog trusted me. He didn't have to care that the dog was there because, see, I didn't give in to his bullshit inside the home. 
when he tried to bolt out the door to go for that walk, I didn't allow it. You know, there were no e-collars, no, nothing like that. I just stopped it. Basically let him know without saying anything, you don't go until I go. And when we go, you're going to follow me. And when I stop, you're going to stop. Okay? This stuff's really important in the dog's eyes, guys. Really important. You know, it's the bread and butter of having a well-behaved dog. So, same dog. And I've talked about this many times. But, you know, people like to harp on the tools. You know, he can he train a dog without an e-collar? Really? How often do you see an e-collar on my dogs? You know what I mean? Come on. And so, after my dad died and we come home with that dog... I've written about this. I've talked about it. We have three other powerful dogs inside the home, and this dog can't be around dogs, right? So he's going to live with my family. He's not going to be separated. So I pull into the driveway. My wife goes in, takes Sophie in the house, and I tell her, okay, let the dogs out. Meanwhile, I start walking away from my house. All three dogs come out to greet him, and he explodes, tries to get to them. I think I had on a a choke chain at the time. That's what my dad had on him. So I didn't care what was on him, tool-wise. When he tried to get them, I just stopped him. I didn't say nothing. I didn't talk. I stopped his ability to attack my dogs, and I continued to move forward. He had two options. Choke yourself or follow me. It was that simple. And we did that. And for the next few times, every time my dogs tried to come in and greet him, he he would explode, but the explosions got smaller and smaller until eventually we were all just walking, okay? Now, when we got through my whole development, about 20 minutes roughly, I got to my house and I took the leash off and he was running around with the other dogs. No problems. Now, from day one, there was tension with him and Bruno, my Rottweiler. They did not like each other. As a matter of fact, to the day he died, they never liked each other. But they never once got into a fight. They don't have a reason to fight. There's no battle for who's in charge there. I'm in charge. My wife's in charge. My kids are in charge. They just didn't like each other. So the very first time Bear came into my house, we walk in through my garage, and the first room you enter from my garage is my kitchen. He went right to the corner of the kitchen and lay down. He was a real mellow dog inside the house, and he found his spot immediately. When I'm walking through the kitchen, Bruno's walking with me, and Bruno glared over at that dog. And at that moment, I exploded on Bruno. I let him know, you don't do that shit in, that in this house. It's real important that Bruno had to know, you can't do that in my house. You are a guest here. This is my house. You don't make those rules. But even more importantly, Bear, my dad's shepherd, had to see that. He had to know, he doesn't have to deal with that shit. I will take care of it. And if I'm not there, my wife will take care of it. Plain and simple. If Bear was laying across the doorway and Renzo, who, you know, was a baby at the time, just a baby. Actually, when we brought Bear into the house, Renzo wasn't even born. He was born right after my dad died. But him and Renzo became inseparable. I mean, that was his best buddy. And Renzo would just sit with him when he was old enough and just mumble and babble. Sometimes for a couple hours and Bear would just lay with him. They were best buddies. But even once Renzo started walking, he knew if Bear was blocking the, the doorway to the kitchen and Renzo was going in there, Renzo wasn't allowed to step over him. He would tell Bear to move. He could barely talk, move. And Bear would get up and move and he'd say thank you and he'd go. You know, Bruno. I didn't have behavioral problems with Bruno. He was the most perfect dog I could ever imagine, right? But if I was laying on the couch and he got up and he'd walk over to me, and he would drop his big, beautiful head on my chest. I didn't pet him. I'd send him away. I'd say, Bruno, go. And he'd go, and he'd walk away, and he'd lay down where he was. And then I would say, Bruno, come here. And he'd come over, and I'd love on him, okay? Because as well-behaved as Bruno was, I can't allow him to come over, drop his head on me, and say, hey, bitch, pet me. Because that's what he's doing. Okay, even though he's a great dog and he loved me and he respected me, he respected me because I didn't let him do those things. Part of it, small part of it, right? So I send him away and then I bring him to me and I love on him on my terms. So I give my dogs plenty of love, plenty of affection, but dressing your dogs up in winter clothes and Halloween costumes and having birthday cakes for them and doing dumb shit, it doesn't help them, guys. 
In fact, it fucking destroys them. It really does. When you want to humanize your dogs, it's going to cause them a lot of confusion. Now, with that being said, there's a lot of people out there that suffer great loss, great loss. And I have clients that have been through hell. And so I totally understand trying to replace that hole with a dog, with a pet. I get it. I'm not blaming you for that. It's total human nature. It really is. But you have to understand when you put those emotions on a dog, it creates so many issues in their life, guys. It's just not how they operate. And so if you really love your dog and want to give them affection, give it through things that they understand. A long walk, throwing a ball, just being with them in peace and harmony. You know, these things are important. One of my favorite things to do with my dogs is go on the back porch with a glass of whiskey and just relax with them. Just be with them. You know, I throw a ball for them. I do all that stuff. I hug on them. I love on them. But I put in that work before we ever get to that point. Okay? Give you another story here. And I know this is going long, but I don't care. No one has to watch it. I'll, you know, I got a call from ladies several years back. Uh, I've talked about this too before. Uh, dog bit their grandchild in the stomach. Bad bite. I have to, you know, they have to have help. So make a long story short, I get there. I ring the bell. I hear the dog going crazy. The woman opens the door. And she's holding the collar. And the dog's going crazy trying to get to me. And I said, let the dog go. She said, I can't. And, and the dog was totally bluffing. I wasn't worried about the dog. I said, you have to let the dog go. She said, I can't let this dog go. He's going to attack you. I said, if you don't let the dog go, I'm going to leave. Finally, she let it go, and the dog was fine. Came out and sniffed me. We walked in, and the uh, dog did nothing. There was nothing wrong with the dog. She was creating that. So we sat down, and we talked. And we sat there, and we're talking for an hour and a half. But while I'm talking, I'm observing what this dog is doing. And there was no doubt in my mind there was nothing wrong with this dog. I'm not saying it didn't bite the baby, which a lot of times could be end it right there. You don't. You can't have a dog like that around a baby, but I didn't see any issues with, with the dog. And then the daughter, the adult daughter, whose child it was, came downstairs with the baby, and I saw a total change. Not in the dog, in the grandmother, the lady who called me, the lady I was talking to. She completely changed and panicked and stressed, and I said, whoa, what are you doing? She said, the dog, the baby. I said, okay, the dog's not doing anything. The dog is fine. The dog is totally neutral and okay with this baby here. And she just couldn't deal with it. She had to get the baby out of there. So I kind of saw what I was up against, okay? So the following week, we start the training. And it was tough. Um, she was about as bad as a client as far as handling skills and understanding that you could do. She struggled. She really struggled really bad, you know? And I'm thinking, this is going to be so hard. I met her husband towards the end of that lesson, you know. And um, when I come back a week later, I meet the husband out front and I see the woman working the dog out back. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, <laughs> what happened? And the husband was like, man, this has been the best thing in the world for her. You don't even understand. I was like, I got to be honest, I'm pretty surprised what I'm seeing here. He goes, yeah, she's done really good and put a lot of time into it. And I'm like, I'm blown away. He goes, well, let me explain something to you. And then he goes in to explain it to me the year that this woman had had. A year. Without going into too much detail, in one year, she lost her father, tragically, not natural, tragically, and two children, tragically, separate. Three major losses in one year. She was destroyed, absolutely destroyed, okay? So I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, but it's very easy to put two and two together. That baby represents something else that she can lose and she's scared to death. And she's putting it out there. She's creating so much stress around this dog and the baby. I don't know how the bite happened. I don't know exactly what happened. But I know this had a lot to do with it. You understand what I'm saying? And broke my heart. Like, and that's why, guys, you never judge anyone when you first see them because you just don't know. 
You just don't know. And so we continued to work and I had a whole new, you know, opinion and, and visual of this woman and I gave her everything and she did phenomenal, phenomenal. Unfortunately, the dog was put down because even though she did fantastic and the dog did fantastic and the baby was around all the time and there were no issues, no signs of issues, the other grandparents found out what happened and gave the ultimatum. You either put the dog down or we go to court and we get custody. So it ended tragically anyway. Um, and I've dealt with a lot of things like that over the years. And so just, just like someone that I'm very fond of and have a ton of respect for that I started off, there has been serious loss there. And so dog training is a lot more than just, you know, sit down and come. So much more than that. Okay, I know I put out so much stuff, how to teach a competition heel or the first e-collar. I know I do a ton of that stuff, but I do a ton of that stuff because people should see that stuff. Contrary to what others believe it, it is important to try to show and give people some guidance. But guys, you can't film the behavior and how to teach a dog how to be a stable dog inside the home. You can't film that. It just has to be something that you decide, okay, we're going to do what's best for this dog. There are no freebies in here. They're going to be treated like a dog. Okay. I saw another client the other day using a trainer. I was so upset. I, I was so upset. You're not going to change a dog's behavior by laying it up with an e-collar. This is coming from a big e-collar guy, right? I've preached it for years. You are not going to change a dog's behavior from lighting it up with an e-collar. In general, there has to be a lot more to it. You understand what I'm saying? Can you stop a dog from chasing sheep and horses? Yes, but there's a lot of work that goes into that prior. And when you have a pet dog that you want to live with in harmony, you don't put any kind of a tool on a on a dog and think you're going to punish that behavior out of them and change the dog's mindset. Doesn't work, guys. It doesn't, if it did, no one would need dog trainers. That stuff is fixed way before you get to that point, okay? So if I have a dog that's dog aggressive and it comes to me, I'm not putting in front of a bunch of dogs. I'm gonna take a couple of weeks and build that relationship with that dog, but they're gonna get nothing without it coming from me. Do you know how much that does to a dog? Okay, let's say I take a, a dog aggressive dog into my home, which is common, right? After the first 10, 15 minutes that dog's there, I'm bringing my dogs out where that dog's staying and my dogs are staying with that dog. That dog may blow up for a few minutes, but guess what happens after a little while? The dog gets nothing out of it. My dogs don't go away. We don't remove the dog. He has to live with them while he's there. And then we do what we do over the next couple of weeks when we have good control and an understanding and the dog trusts us and knows that everything comes from me, then we could take him out and start seeing some dogs and everything becomes much easier. Okay, much easier. If you're going to have well-behaved dogs, it starts in the home. Okay, if you're with your dog, you are training. You just have to decide, are you training for good or are you training for bad? I don't know what else I can say about this. I can give you examples all day, guys, all day. It's what got me started with the dogs. That's all I cared about, okay? I didn't teach anything. There was no place command. There was no fancy healing. There were no e-collars, none of that stuff. It was just how to get dogs to behave for their owners. That was it, and you know what? I miss it. I miss those days because it was a lot simpler and no one can give you shit. There, you know, there's no one can complain. I didn't use food. I use food now to teach everything. I didn't use food. I didn't use tools. You know, I see people get a man. I saw a video the other day, an aggressive dog, and they put the prong collar on the dog. I'm like, holy shit. Like, have we gotten that far? That's, that's just not good. A tool isn't going to fix your dogs, okay? I've said it a thousand times. No tool can bring out the best in your dog. Only training can do that. You know, a tool can bring out the best in your training, but it could also bring out the worst. Don't forget that. Focus on the behavior and the obedience is easy, okay? You have to do it. So if you have these dogs inside your home 
and they're doing things like some of the things we said and they're they're there comes a time guys where you got to say fuck it you get nothing you get nothing you're here because of me and you're not getting anything unless it comes from me it has to be to that point and then what you're going to find is the things that you deal with on the outside of the home where they give you trouble that's going to get better very easy i promise you but if your dog is an asshole inside the home, you can't expect him to be not be an asshole outside of the home. You understand what I'm saying? So I know this is long, but I think we've gotten too far away of teaching a dog to be very obedient. It's why, um, and when I say obedient, I mean well-behaved inside the home. It's why when people come to me with a puppy, I don't charge for puppy classes. I set them up in the beginning and I ask them to do certain things for the first few months. Just do this. And they're like, okay, but what about how do we teach this? I don't give a fuck about how you teach. Don't worry about that stuff. Let's just set yourself up to have a really well-behaved dog that's exposed to a lot of things and learns how to live with you, you know, like, like part of your life without being a pain in the ass. That simple, guys. And if you miss that boat when you have a puppy, too bad. Too bad because it's such a, a easy thing to create if you put a little bit of work into it. The more work you put into it those first few months, the better off you're going to be. You could spend a little bit of money up front, maybe none, or you could spend a fortune down the road. That's it. Okay? So for you folks that have behavioral problems, no tool is going to fix it. No kind of obedience is going to fix it. Obedience is a good, you know, it's a good addition. I'm not saying don't do obedience. That's part of it, guys. But maybe 20%, in my opinion. The meat and potatoes is inside the home, what you're doing when you live with that dog. If you can't walk your dog nicely on a loose leash next to you, past whatever, if you can't do that, then as far as obedience goes, you have to at least conquer that. That's the most basic things, but it's still such a tremendous tool, you know, on a flat collar and a leash. And then people say, well, if it helps a client, why can't they just use a prong collar? That's fine. It's not that I have a problem with that, guys. The problem I have with it is, is the dog trained? If you have to have a prong collar on for the dog to walk nicely? In my opinion, no, it's not. You know, it's just like if your dog don't come to you when it's off leash around distractions without an e-collar, is it trained? No, it's not. I'm sorry. It's not. <laughs> the, the end result should be that the dog listens to the verbal command that that should be what you strive for okay so for you people struggling with your dogs find someone who could focus on the behavior a little bit and doesn't bullshit you and try to take your money okay a two-week program without serious follow-ups it's not going to do much for you you know i just spoke to a guy here today at my other job Sent his dog away for two weeks. Didn't spend a fortune, you know, like $1,000. So that's very cheap. And uh, he said, I think it helped a little. I'm not quite sure. I said, well, if you think it helped a little, then you got robbed. Because it didn't. It should come back and you just say, man, what a difference. You know, it's freaking great. It's awesome. What a difference in two weeks. But when you say, I think it helped a little, that means it didn't help at all. So, you, you know, you threw the dog away and... Two weeks don't cut it. Two weeks is okay for a board and train if you got, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 hours of follow-up private lessons where you could educate the owner and, hey, let's keep this going. But what does two weeks do when you give the dog back to the owner with nothing? It's not going to do it. It's temporary. It's temporary, you know? It's a waste of time. Waste of time. So, and that's why friends and family, I'm sorry, but I don't want to help you with your dogs. I just don't. I don't want to help you with your dogs because it's a lot more than giving you a quick answer or spending an hour with you. I charge $3,850 and with that $3,850 comes a minimum of a three-week board and train, a minimum of 10 private lessons, and really lifetime assistance if you want me, okay? So if I'm going to help friends or family with your dog, I'm not going to charge you that kind of money because for one, you don't want to pay it and you don't want the real help. And then I'm taking time away from my family, which is very valuable and precious to me and I'm not willing to do it. So I hope some of you guys see this. If you want real training, hit me up. If you just want some help, 
and half-ass things, don't hit me up. I'm, I, I'm, I have no interest in doing that anymore. And I know that may seem shitty to people who know me, but everyone that knows you or lives near you and wants help, they think because they know you, you know, I'm supposed to charge you $50 to train your dog. I'm so over all of that. It's expensive for a reason, okay? You're, you're going to be very happy. You're not going to say, I think it made a difference. It's never gonna happen, okay? So this is long. I've been out of pocket for a while, but comment here. At, you know, you have questions, ask. We'll, we'll talk about it all you want. Behavior over obedience all day for me, guys. All day, okay? Peace.